Good morning. Um, I'm obviously not Dr. Roman. He's out of town and uh, asked me to start our, our morning brain rounds. Uh, one thing I wanted to remind everyone of, and I'll reiterate this at the end of Grand Rounds, is that um, next Thursday, both before and after Grand Rounds, there will be flu shots distributed um, out here. So if you have not yet gotten your flu shot, and I do know that we do have flu in the community already, is that right, Forrest? Um, uh, make sure you uh, take time to do that. You can go online. There's a form to fill out. Um, and to do that in advance, it will expedite that. So. In uh, Dr. Roman's uh, absence, and to continue this tradition, I have a few historical facts uh, that happened on, on this day in history. Uh, the first is in 1814, the first ever plastic surgery was performed by a physician named Joseph Carcon. Um, and he performed this on a British soldier who had lost his nose due to the toxic effect of mercury treatments. So talk about side effects to drugs. I think this was a significant one. And this was the herald for um, uh, plastic surgery um, as we know it in the modern era. Um, also in this day, in, on this day in 1879, Thomas Edison was successful in creating the first light bulb. And that is probably, arguably, one of the most transformative things that has happened to us and has allowed us to um, not burn the midnight oil, but to stay up late, and, and uh, we can thank you for our sleep deprivation because we all are now able to see very late and stay up as late as we want. And um, uh, also, uh, Michael Crichton was born in 1942 on this day, and as you guys know, he was actually a Harvard-trained physician who wrote numerous books, uh, some of them notably the Andromeda Strain, which is somewhat prescient for our Ebola here that we're having, and also uh, Jurassic Park. And then lastly, in 1986, the Nobel Prize winner Edward Doisy died. Um, and he was actually credited with the discovery of vitamin K, so a fairly recent um, uh, discovery that, again, has allowed us to care for our patients in, in a variety of ways, both blocking vitamin K, but also uh, repleting them. So, um, lots of interesting things in history today, and I will um, now invite Dr. David Nunley to come forward and um, introduce our grand note speaker. Good morning. Well, the last two and a half decades have seen quite an evolution in the approach and treatment of pulmonary diseases. Uh, our understandings now of in inflammation and reparative and remodeling processes have certainly changed the whole paradigm of how we treat patients with advanced lung disease. Uh, our speaker today is someone who has been very, very much involved in that uh, uh, transition over those years and has seen it firsthand. And actually, I believe his talk today is going to express some of those uh, things that we've learned in the last 25 years. Dr. Robert Kotliff um, uh, attended Brown University and matriculated to uh, Yale University School of Medicine. After completing his medical degree, he was a uh, internal medicine resident at Temple University in Philadelphia. And then went on to the prestigious University of Pennsylvania Pulmonary and Critical Care Program. And after completing his training there, he's actually remained there uh, for 27 years uh, and recently has moved on to become the chairman of the Department of Pulmonary Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, while at uh, Penn, Dr. Kotliff uh, was instrumental in uh, not only leading their cystic fibrosis program, but also uh, making their lung transplant program one of the premier programs in the United States. And when he left the University of Pennsylvania earlier this year, he was the chief of the, advanced, the section of advanced lung disease and lung transplantation. Um, Dr. Pavlov has um, uh, published more than 60 peer-reviewed articles, multiple book chapters, <laughs> and served on many societies and task, force, task forces for many of the major societies in the United States. I had the good fortune of serving with him on a couple of uh, uh, committees and task forces, and I can tell you that I've always been impressed with his, uh, his presence and his leadership. And so I'm very privileged to uh, present him to you today. So please join with me in welcoming from Cleveland Clinic, uh, Dr. Robert Pottle. 
you very much for that gracious introduction and also for the kind invitation to come here and see your beautiful city and your wonderful medical center. and i had the opportunity to have dinner with a number of members of the pulmonary division and in particular with jesse roman last night who's an absolutely delightful individual as i'm sure you all know. so i picked a somewhat unusual topic and i always feel i have to make a few apologies to start particularly when i'm talking to non-pulmonologists in an audience because why would you want to hear about a disease that um you may never see uh in fact you may never be able to pronounce um and even as a practicing pulmonologist if you see one or two cases in your entire career it may be a lot the reason i like to talk about this disease is i think it has a number of important lessons one lesson is the importance of basic science and the insights it provides in understanding disease pathogenesis and then in defining and introducing rational treatment and the second is i think there's a remarkable tale behind this that i'll um, talk about in just a minute the, the power of motherhood uh, and um, the power of uh, lobbying congress to move forward in a disease that was neglected for many many years so hopefully by the end of this you'll uh, you'll enjoy at least uh, learning a little bit about a very unusual uh, orphan disease so let me just give you some basic uh basic overview of what I'm now going to call LAM instead of having to continue to say angiolyomatosis. <laughs> this is a disease uh, that has some unusual characteristics. It's almost exclusively uh, seen in women and typically uh, during childbearing years, so peak incidence is between the ages of 20 and 40. It's characterized by smooth muscle proliferation and infiltration that involves <clears throat> predominantly the lungs and within the lungs, the airways, the blood vessels, and the lymphatics. And is also characterized, as we'll see, by cystic destruction of the lung parenchyma. It has three characteristic features that certainly the oncologists in the group here will recognize as characteristic of cancer. Um, unregulated cell growth, vascular and lymphatic spread, as I'll show you in some subsequent slides, and local tissue invasion and destruction. And for that reason, the paradigm of this disease has shifted from looking at it as an interstitial lung disease or diffuse parenchymal lung disease to what is now being described as, um, and I'll quote from a recent review article, LAM is the simplest of human cancers. Let me tell you a little bit about the, uh, the history of this disease. And this gets into the mother, child, and orphan disease uh, story here. So the first case of what we recognize as uh, LAM was um, published in the medical literature in 1919. It took another 50 years until enough cases were recognized that a case series was published. So in 1966, the first case series appeared in the literature. And um, to that time, it was basically recognized as a medical curiosity. It was also recognized as a lethal disease. And in fact, the what was uh, observed in the 1966 case series and a couple others that ensued was that from diagnosis to death was basically 10 years. So this was a disease that was felt to be lethal um, and to um, basically robbing young women of a normal uh, life expectancy. So here's where the story of the mother and child come in. So in 1994, uh, Andrea Burns, who was then a 22-year-old young woman, was diagnosed with LAM. Her mother, Sue Burns, took her around first to a number of community pulmonologists and then to some of the major academic medical centers in Ohio. They actually lived in, in the Cincinnati area. And Sue Burns was very frustrated to realize that no one knew anything about this disease. She delved a little further into the medical literature and realized there was absolutely nothing in the literature that provided any answers. So now she was dealing with a daughter who basically had been told that she had 10 years to live and no one knew anything about what to do beyond that. Obviously a very frustrating situation. <laughs> But this was a mother who was not to be um, stopped, and what she did was she created a grassroots effort, um, lobbied a number of other mothers involved in organizations throughout the country, um, ended up collecting a large number of signatures, and ultimately lobbied Congress to provide funding. Um, at the time, in the 1990s, Congress was very interested in funding women's health initiatives, which largely meant breast cancer initiatives. She managed to get some money committed to um, starting a registry at the NIH and providing some seed money for um, pilot studies looking into the pathogenesis of this disease. And from there, we have an explosion in the understanding and in fact, the treatment of this disease 
So in 1995, Sue Burns established the Lamb Foundation in Cincinnati. It remains there to the present time. In 1997, Congress came through with NIH funding to fund a registry where women from around the country would be paid to come to the NIH every six months to donate blood, other tissue specimens, get various PFTs and other testing performed so that we could understand better the natural history of this disease. In 1998, the underlying genetic mutation was identified. By 2001, the signaling pathway through which this mutation acted was identified. And then impressively, in 2003 and 2005, the two clinical trials that demonstrated the clinical efficacy, the therapeutic efficacy of serolimus or rapamycin in treating this disease. So from a grassroots effort in 1995 to 2011, we now understand the pathogenesis of this disease and have effective treatment. So let's go into a little bit about the epidemiology of this disease. There are actually two forms. There's one form that occurs in the setting of an equally unusual disease that you may have heard about in medical school or subsequently, and that's tuberous sclerosis, a neurocutaneous syndrome that in its full-blown form is characterized by severe cognitive impairment and seizures, but in its mildest form, you would not recognize that a patient necessarily had the disease. But curiously, patients with TSC, about 30 to 40 percent of them will develop cystic changes that are characteristic of LAM. There's a second form of LAM, so-called sporadic LAM, that occurs in the absence of TSC. Importantly, LAM may be the only manifestation of TSC. You may not see the other characteristic cutaneous lesions, seizures, cognitive impairment. And as I mentioned, about a third of patients with TSC will have LAM changes. And then in terms of sporadic LAM, it was initially estimated to be quite rare, three to five cases per million. But I can tell you from having established a LAM clinic at the University of Pennsylvania, where we grew from 12 patients to over 80 patients in just a three-year span, this is clearly an under-recognized disorder. And where we're starting to recognize it more and more is with incidental detection of the disease for women who are undergoing CTs for abdominal pain, kidney stones, et cetera, where we'll stumble across cystic changes that we otherwise would never have known about. So we are discovering a whole end of the spectrum that very often would otherwise remain subclinical. Both forms, as I mentioned, are seen almost exclusively in women. In the TSC variant, there are a handful of cases that have been reported in men. And in the sporadic form, there is this one curious case that was described in one of the pulmonary journals of a patient, a male patient with, and in fact, genetically proven to be male, who developed the sporadic form of LAM. To this day, that remains unexplained. The average age of diagnosis is 35 years, although many of these patients have had symptoms for a number of years and were misdiagnosed. So this is not age of onset, this is age of diagnosis. At least to the present time, this seems to be a disease that has a high predilection for Caucasian women, but some of this may be under-reporting due to differential access to health care and also to the internet that may actually skew our perspective on the ethnic distribution of this disease. Well, how about the clinical features? As with many lung diseases, they're relatively nonspecific. Virtually all patients who have lung disease are short of breath, so that certainly doesn't help us in narrowing down the differential. But you can see at presentation about almost half of patients will present with dyspnea on exertion. During the course of the disease, the overwhelming majority of patients will develop some degree of dyspnea. The other characteristic presenting feature, the most common way that women will present, is with a spontaneous pneumothorax. It is often ascribed to the usual benign pneumothoraces that we see in young adults. And at some time in the course of the disease, about two-thirds of women will develop at least one pneumothorax. And then there's a number of other nonspecific findings. The one that I will point out that's very characteristic and that should make you at least think about the disease is the development of a chyloseffusion in a young woman. Most of us, when we think of chyloseffusions, think of lymphoma as the most common cause, or there are also traumatic forms of chyloseffusion. But I want you to at least remember that if you stumble across a young woman with a chyloseffusion, 
that you should be thinking about LAM as uh, one of the etiologies in the differential. This is the radiographic presentation of, of LAM. This is a very characteristic uh, CT scan. And what you can see are these innumerable cysts um, that are generally relatively round in appearance and very slightly um, in size. Um, in this case, if you look closely, you can actually see the walls of the cysts, but they're not always that obvious. And for that reason, you can see that to a relatively inexperienced radiologist, they're much more likely to call this emphysema than they are to call this LAM. And in fact, one of the common disorders that uh, the LAM is often misdiagnosed as is um, precocious onset of emphysema. You have to wonder why a 25-year-old woman would develop emphysema, um, but um, at least radiographically, um, it's often confused. In terms of uh, functional impairment of the lungs, um, early on in the disease, um, pulmonary function studies may in fact be normal. And in fact, in the NIH registry that was created to track women across the country with this disease, about a third of patients at the time of diagnosis actually had normal PFTs. When PFTs become abnormal, and they do so in the vast majority of patients, <clears throat> the characteristic pattern is of airflow obstruction. And you may also see a decrease in diffusing capacity. This is important because if you think about it, a young individual with shortness of breath who has a spirometry done in the office that shows airflow obstruction, the most common diagnosis that's going to be made is what? Asthma, common things occurring commonly. Most of these women are told they have asthma before someone stumbles across the correct diagnosis. Uh, in many cases, as I've mentioned, the disease is progressive and general rate of decline is about, uh, on average, 100 cc's per year. But there is a wide variation. There are some patients who have a very aggressive form of the disease that does, in fact, rapidly progress and unfold over about a 10-year period. But there are other women who, over the equal amount of time, will show absolutely no change in lung function and may, in fact, maintain the lung function. The histology of LAM is shown here, and I've learned as a non-pathologist that if I just sort of show my pointer like this, you'll all believe what I say. Um, so what I am going to tell you is that um, what you're seeing here is a uh, dramatic proliferation of uh, smooth muscle appearing cells. Um, this is a higher power view. Um, but one of the important points I want to make here is that if you just get small snippets of lung, so if you subject patients to bronchoscopy and take a biopsy, very often, the pathologist will look at this and think they look like fibroblasts. So it's not uncommon in the past with transbronchial biopsy to get the impression that the patient has a fibrotic lung disorder rather than LAM. And in fact, transbronchial biopsies until recently were abandoned as a diagnostic procedure in, in establishing the diagnosis here. That's changed uh, a bit with the um, recognition that there's actually a specific stain, HMV45, which Curiously, it's a stain that was developed um, for diagnosing melanoma. Um, but for some reason, the smooth muscle cells uh, that proliferate in them, and not all of them, but just for some reason, uh, a smattering of them, will take up this uh, immunostain. The advantage is twofold. Um, it makes it much easier to establish the di to diagnosis. And importantly, it makes it easier to establish the diagnosis with very small tissue specimens. So we've revisited the notion of using transbronchial biopsies. And there's a recent report that actually suggests that you can make the diagnosis in about 50% of cases simply by doing a transbronchial biopsy and therefore sparing the patient a thoracoscopic uh, surgical lung biopsy. There's a second feature of this disease that um, occurs outside the lungs. <coughs> And that is uh, a benign lesion of the kidney known as an angiomyelitoma or AML. The overwhelming majority of patients who have the TSC form of LAM will in fact have renal AMLs along with multiple hematomas throughout the body. But even patients who have sporadic LAM, while this was initially thought to be a pulmonary only disorder, in fact anywhere between a third and 50% depending on the series uh, that's been published, will have renal AMLs. Uh, these AMLs are basically benign tumors 
They have no potential to transform into malignant tumors. And they're composed of basically three constituents. They're highly vascular. They contain a large number of blood vessels. They contain the characteristic lamb smooth muscle cells that stain positive for HMV45. And importantly, in the overwhelming majority of cases, they contain fat, which when this is radiographically apparent, we take advantage of because you can make the diagnosis simply from its radiographic appearance on CAT scan. The problem is that there are lipid poor AMLs that appear as solid renal lesions. So another way that lamb patients get to us or enter the medical system is actually through the urology clinics where patients are referred because they have a mass on the kidney. There's a suspicion of renal cell carcinoma. They end up getting a surgical biopsy and a diagnosis of AML is established. And then if you have an astute urologist, they're going to know that if you have a woman with an AML, you need to get a CAT scan. Not all AMLs are associated with lamb. There are isolated AMLs that can occur. But in many cases, AML is the first sign of an underlying diagnosis of lamb. AMLs are usually clinically silent, but they can present with flank pain, hematuria, and in rare cases, with loss of renal function. There is a risk of hemorrhage. I told you that these are highly vascular. They do tend to grow. And if they grow beyond about four centimeters in diameter, there is a significant risk of hemorrhage such that we preemptively will address the issue. And I'll show you in some subsequent slides how we do so. This is the characteristic radiographic appearance, CT appearance, of angio-AMLs or angiomyolipomas of the kidney. You can see the kidneys are not only enlarged, but you see these areas that have characteristic attenuation of fat. And really, you don't need to go any further in this case. There's nothing else that looks like this in the kidney, so this would be considered diagnostic of an AML. Sometimes these lesions can become quite large. This was a patient of mine who you can imagine you could actually palpate on physical examination. This is the left kidney. And at least on this portion, there's no recognizable renal parenchyma. This is all going to be replaced by fat. And on this side, not quite as dramatic. And there's also some areas of increased attenuation, which are actually due to an embolization procedure that I'll discuss in a few minutes. AMLs can also be tricky. They tend to recur if resected. And actually, the prior treatment for this was surgical resection when they grew to be too large. And here's an example of a patient who had had a prior right nephrectomy. And then in the prior surgical bed, you can see this fat density mass here, soft tissue density, that is recurrence of the AML in the surgical bed. I want to spend a few minutes talking about another, to me, fascinating part of this story, which is our current understanding of the molecular pathogenesis of this disease. And as I showed you on that timeline, all of this came about with an explosion of interest in the disease between around 1995 and present time. The other thing that's happened that has really advanced the understanding of this disease is by recharacterizing it as a cancer, we've really gotten not just the pulmonary community, but the oncology community and some very, very smart scientists in the oncology community to have an interest in this disease. Elizabeth Henschke, who's at Harvard, is one of the leaders in this area. And in fact, she was the first to describe the genetic mutations. These are mutations in TSC1 and TSC2. These genes are tumor suppressor genes that encode for two proteins, Tuberin and Hamertin, respectively. These proteins, as I'll show you on the next slide, are involved in a signaling pathway. And dysfunction or inactivation of these proteins leads to loss of normal control of cell growth and proliferation. These mutations in the setting of patients who have tuberous sclerosis are germline mutations, so they affect all cells throughout the body. Whereas women who have the sporadic form of LAM, the mutations are only found in affected tissue. So 
only in the lung or in renal AML would you find these mutations. If you biopsied the skin or looked at other tissue, um, you would not detect these. So this is my one and only signaling pathway that I'll show you here, and I'll try to stumble my way through this. Uh, this was probably, probably the most important discovery that was made. So after it was noted that the um, genetic mutations involved TSC1 and TSC2, the question was, how did these genetic mutations ultimately <laughs> lead to disease pathogenesis? And um, what came about was an understanding that these proteins, the protein products of these genes, are um, intimately involved in the AKT signaling pathway, which is basically a pathway that controls normal cell growth proliferation, also angiogenesis. And these proteins actually exert an inhibitory influence on mTOR, the mammalian target of rapamycin. Dysfunction of these proteins actually allows the signaling pathway to continue in a constitutive fashion, in an ongoing fashion that then leads to unchecked cell proliferation. This same pathway has now been implicated in a number of malignancies, as well as in LAM. Um, and the important point here is um, that we now have some potential therapeutic targets, in particular mTOR, to consider in developing rational treatment approaches to this disease. Another issue that came up uh, that we've gained an understanding uh, in is why is this a destructive process? Why do you see those cysts throughout the lung parenchyma? The previous um, theory was that this actually was a post-obstructive phenomenon. If you obstruct a small air airway, that you get dilatation of the airway distal to the obstruction. Um, that actually is not true. This is not, those are not airways in any way. Um, those are actually um, destructive areas of lung. And in fact, what we've now seen is that if you look at um, lung tissue from patients with LAM, there's evidence of upregulation of a number of MMPs or matrix metalloproteinases um, that are destructive proteinases that, that lead to um, cyst formation. Um, and not only does it cause local destruction, but it may actually uh, be responsible for promoting metastatic spread of, of LAM cells. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a minute as well. So this is something I alluded to uh, earlier, which is that we've shifted our paradigm, our understanding of this disease from looking at LAM as an interstitial lung disease to looking at LAM as a cancer. I showed you that there, the three cardinal features that um, define cancer can actually be applied to um, this disease as well. And I just want to show you some additional evidence that has really fueled um, this um, newer approach that we're actually dealing with a low-grade malignancy uh, rather than a benign interstitial process. Um, so several groups have shown that you can see LAM cell clusters that start to bud off of lymphatics. Um, they can also be found in pleural fusions in the, in the chylus fluid um, that's tapped from the chest, and they can be found in regional lymph node groups. So there's evidence that these cells are occurring outside of the lung itself. Uh, the NIH group has shown that LAM cells can be isolated from the bloodstream certainly a characteristic feature of metastatic disease. Um, and in their study published a number of years ago, about half of patients with LAM were shown to have circulating HMV45 positive smooth muscle cells in the bloodstream. Um, this is perhaps one of the most fascinating uh, observations that's been made, which is that LAM actually recurs in the allograft after lung transplantation and the LAM cells that are found in the donor allograft are actually of recipient origin, so they have to get there somehow. And the feeling is that they probably migrate or metastasize either from the bloodstream or from regional lymph, lymph nodes, and then they infiltrate the donor allograft. So that begs the question of if this is a metastatic disease to the lung, what's the primary site of origin? And there are two theories, both of them still speculative. One theory is that actually the kidney is the primary site of infection. Arguing for that is the presence of angiomyolipomas and the notion that you can then get cells breaking off from the kidney, traveling to the lung, which as you know, serves as a major filtering mechanism for debris and cells. So that theory sort of makes sense, except for the fact 
that AMLs are only seen, as I mentioned, in about a third to a half of patients with sporadic LAM, even on careful microscopic inspection of kidneys. So if you can't find the AML in the kidney, how can you blame the kidney as the primary site? There's now newer evidence evolving that actually the uterus is the primary site. Um, and in fact, there was a recent publication showing that women with LAM who have undergone hysterectomies, um, that you can actually find these microscopic nests of LAM cells within the uterus, and maybe in fact that's the primary site of, of uh, disease. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, the diagnosis and start with just some general statements. I mentioned before that the average age of diagnosis is 35 years, but uh, again, pointing out that that's not the average age of onset of symptoms. In fact, um, most women have had symptoms for a number of years. Um, and in fact, many women, unfortunately, have gone through at least two spontaneous pneumothoraces before the diagnosis has been definitively established. For reasons that I mentioned before, um, very commonly, the initial diagnosis can be asthma. Again, young woman with some airflow obstruction on, on PFTs, that would certainly be the first thing I would think about. <laughs> And we're not in a habit of subjecting all people who are short of breath with mild airflow obstruction to CAT scans. So in the absence of that, you really would not detect the disease. Um, and if you do image the chest, um, very often the radiologist looking at that CAT scan that I showed you will not think of LAM. Um, although more recently, now that we've become more aware of the disease, I think that's not as true. But very commonly, and I still see this, these patients are um, told they have emphysema. Um, even though the overwhelming majority are not smokers. And in fact, the first thing that's done uh, by the pulmonologist who sees this patient is they get out the 1A trypsin levels because they're thinking, why should a young individual develop precocious emphysema? Well, how do we make the diagnosis? And this is an important point, and one of the reasons that um, we're really trying to send the message out here that these patients need to go to specialized centers even before the diagnosis is firmly established. The reason is that there's still a tendency to take these patients to a surgical lung biopsy. And in the current um, day, it's actually unnecessary in the vast majority of cases because there are non-invasive or minimally invasive ways of establishing the diagnosis. And I'm just going to highlight those in this slide. So if you have a CAT scan that shows cystic lung disease in combination with an AML, you have established your diagnosis. So the first thing we do as pulmonologists when we see that chest CT is we get an abdominal CT, where you can even very simply get an abdominal ultrasound and you will pick up AMLs. That is considered diagnostic. Additionally, if you have cystic lung disease in association with a chylo suffusion, and you've ruled out lymphoma, you've made your diagnosis. And finally, in patients who clearly have an established diagnosis or whom you can establish a diagnosis of TS, you've also established your diagnosis without ever having to get any tissue. A second way that we have a strong suggestion of the diagnosis, I won't say it's always definitive, but if you have that characteristic looking CAT scan in a non-smoking female, that's not because the absence of smoking rules out emphysema. Again, that's not in the differential. It's because the absence of smoking actually rules out a second form of cystic lung disease that we see that radiographically can be very similar, something called Langerhans cell histiocytosis, previously known as eosinophilic granuloma or histiocytosis X. Um, that is a disease, a cystic lung disease, almost exclusively in smokers. So young woman, cystic lung disease, non-smoker, you have pretty compelling evidence of what you're dealing with. There is now a biomarker that was first identified by the group at the University of Cincinnati, just north of the border here, um, and that's VEGFD. VEGFD is a lymphangiogenesis factor, and I'll show you on the next slide some pretty compelling data showing that we can now use this as a non-invasive diagnostic tool. The problem with it is it's not yet commercially available does require a little bit of extra effort because you have to send the patient to a lab, the blood's drawn, but then it has to be shipped off to the University of Cincinnati. Many insurance companies are not covering for it, so very often the patient will bear the burden of the, the cost of the, the uh, test. I mentioned the transbronchial lung biopsy. Um, 
the old adage was it's not worth doing the new lesson is it's probably worth doing if these other methods are either not applicable or fail to establish a diagnosis because at least in certain centers they're now reporting about a 50% yield from transbronchial biopsy and only in cases where you could not establish the diagnosis in any other way there's still significant diagnostic uncertainty would you now subject a patient to a surgical lung biopsy so that clearly has become the exception this is data from the Cincinnati group although I believe Young has since moved but this is Frank McCormick's group at the University of Cincinnati looking at serum VEGFD levels and importantly they did this study in the right way which is they took not just healthy individuals as a control group but they looked at other groups that are frequently in the differential diagnosis of cystic lung disease emphysema being one which is as we said not a true cystic disease but then Berthold-Dubé, Sjogren's, Langerhans cell histiocytosis and you can see there's a pretty nice cutoff here beyond which and this is about 800 picograms per ml beyond which none of these other diseases seem to cause elevations in that range so if you have a VEGFD level that exceeds 800 that seems to be rather compelling evidence that you're dealing with LAM the problem is that there are a number of LAM patients who fall into a gray zone or clearly have so-called normal VEGFD levels so the absence of a markedly elevated level is not helpful the presence of a markedly elevated level is now considered diagnostic in the appropriate clinical and radiographic context what's the differential diagnosis and I'm not going to go through this very busy slide what I tell my pulmonary fellows is the good news is you don't have to learn an extensive differential diagnosis of cystic lung disease there are only four diseases that cause this the bad news is that they're all incredibly obscure diseases that you're going to forget a hundred times before you remember what they are but I will at least go through them with you they're all fascinating diseases and I have to say one of the fascinating things for me as I've gotten involved in the LAM community is you start out learning about one obscure disease and you end up learning about four because not only do I have patients referred to me who have LAM but I have patients referred to me who are misdiagnosed as having LAM because they have cysts and suddenly you do have to learn about these other disorders that can mimic the diagnosis so the other diseases are Langerhans cell histiocytosis a newly described disease at least in the pulmonary community but a disease that's been known to dermatologists and actually oncologists for a number of years because there's an increased risk of renal cell cancer with this disease this is a disease known as Berthold-Dubé actually named after three Canadian dermatologists who first described the disease and then something called lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia let me at least show you some imaging that's associated with these but point out on this slide that in addition to imaging characteristics that differ between the four diseases you have to look for other manifestations very often outside the lung that will clue you into alternative diagnosis other than LAM PFT findings LAM and Langerhans share in common airflow obstruction but these other two disorders in Berthold-Dubé PFTs are normal in LIP typically restrictive and then there's some adjunct labs that can be used I talked about VEGFD in LAM and there's actually a follicular mutation analysis that can be done to diagnose this disease so let me show you radiographically some of these other diseases this is my new fascination a disease called Berthold-Dubé as I mentioned that is characterized by some subtle but characteristic skin lesions and by the development of cystic lung disease but you can see already that these cysts look nothing like LAM cysts they're large they're irregular in shape they tend to hug the subpleural regions and there are very few of them compared to the LAM cysts this is where confusion sometimes comes up because you can also see dermatologic manifestations of tuberous sclerosis with LAM so if a woman presents with a rash on the face these sort of hard nodules often this can be 
misdiagnosed as TS-associated lesions, but in fact, these are called fibrofolliculomas. These are the characteristic skin manifestations of Bernhardt-Dubé, and you can actually make the diagnosis of Bernhardt-Dubé simply by doing a very simple skin biopsy. Sometimes these lesions are very subtle. This is some lesions on the neck of one of our patients, and if you didn't look closely, you would miss these, or you might want to just misdiagnose these as skin tags, for example. This is Langerhans cell histiocytosis, which is a disease almost exclusively of smokers. In its earliest presentation, it looks nothing like LAM because it's very nodular in its appearance, but you can see that you occasionally will start to see cavitation or cyst formation. Here it's a little bit more obvious. We sometimes call this the Cheerio sign, which are these small, thick-walled little cysts just starting to form. But as the disease progresses, it progresses to a purely cystic form. In its classic form, it looks different from LAM in that the cysts are more irregular in their shape and they're more variable in their size, and the walls are somewhat thicker than what I showed you in the typical case of LAM. But I can tell you there are cases of Langerhans cell that are radiographically indistinguishable from LAM. This is LIP that you may know as in a couple of its forms, so it's a HIV-defining illness, particularly in children. It's also seen in a number of immunologic disorders, including lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, common variable immunodeficiency. And again, in its classic radiographic form, you don't see a lot of cysts, and you also see, in addition to cysts, parenchymal changes. So here you see ground glass opacities surrounding the cyst, and very often this will start as ground glass, and then as the disease evolves, you'll see the cysts subsequently appear. But nothing follows the textbook, so here's a case of LIP that I came across that I thought was LAM because all there was was cysts without accompanying parenchymal changes, but in fact this proved on biopsy to be LIP. So that's the differential, all relatively obscure diseases. In many cases, if you pay attention to the CAT scan alone, you can actually differentiate between these. Well, once we've made the diagnosis of LAM, what are you obligated to do as a clinician? And there are a couple things. One is we do at least a preliminary screening for plain TS. I mentioned that not all patients with TS will have cognitive impairment, seizures, so sometimes you have to look very hard to find it. Why is it important to find? It doesn't change your approach to the patient. It does change your approach to the patient's desire to have children because there's genetic counseling that goes along with that. This can be an absolutely devastating disease, and you want to at least be able to provide appropriate counseling to the patient should she decide that she wants to have children. So we screen, and that includes a careful physical examination. I'm one who absolutely loves physical exams and all the little clues that you learn from it, and I'll show you some of the characteristic findings if you look closely that you can see on a patient with TS. We also, in a patient who's been diagnosed with LAM, we also want to screen for AMLs because if they are of a certain size, we're going to want to intervene preemptively, as I'll mention in a second. And then we want to get a sense of if there is impairment in lung function, and if so, how severe. So that basically means screening PFTs and ambulatory oximetry looking for evidence of desaturation if the oxygen level is normally pressed. These are some of the characteristic changes of TS, and you probably had a single lecture in medical school that you've since forgotten that goes over a number of these, but I'll remind you what these are. These are Chagrin's patches, which are these raised, roughened lesions very often on the trunk. These are hypopigmented macules that commonly occur in clusters, so they're called confetti lesions because they look sort of like confetti. This used to be called adenoma sebaceum on the face in a malar distribution. It's now called angiofibromas. This is a very characteristic feature, and this is the one that, when I showed you the fibrofolliculomas of Bernhard Dubé, they often can get confused. This is the most subtle sign, but one of the things that I ask all my patients who present with LAM to do is they have to take off their shoes and their socks, and you have to look at all ten toes, and you have to look at all ten fingers, 
because very often the only sign that you'll see of TS is this little heaped up area on a nail called an ungual fibroma. And you may simply see a single one of these, but that's all you need to raise your suspicion that the patient has TS. A second way to screen in a more definitive way is actually to do a, an MR or a head CT, and even in patients with normal uh, cognitive function and no seizures, you'll very often come across characteristic changes, these uh, cortical tubers um, or uh, subependental calcifications, and occasionally you'll see astrocytomas. These are all characteristic neurologic imaging manifestations of TS, and for women who really want to know whether they do or don't have the disease, um, this is the second step. Third step would be to send them to a geneticist, and there's now a com commercially available test to look at TSC1 and TSC2 mutations. Well, how about treatment? To me, this is the most fascinating part of the story, and um, I'll actually go through this relatively quickly so we don't run out of time here. Um, and there are four approaches, uh, hormonal manipulation, and the reason I've grayed this out is that this has largely fallen out of favor. Serolimus, also known as rapamycin, which is a specific mTOR inhibitor, and based on the pathway that I showed you previously, you can understand why there was a tremendous interest in looking at this drug in the treatment of this disease. Simvastatin, seems like statins do everything. It should be in our water supply. And there's actually some evidence that statins may have a role in treating this disease, and I'll show you that in a minute. And then ultimately, for those patients who do progress to advanced disease, transplantation. Well, how about hormonal therapy? This was the initial therapy that was uh, tried. And there was certainly a, a sound logic to this. I mentioned that this is a disease almost exclusively of women, which suggests that there's a hormonal, hormonal underpinning to this. Um, the estrogen receptor actually uh, works through the AKT pathway, so it's the same pathway. Um, that I showed you before, so it makes sense that maybe estrogen is involved in the disease. Um, there are studies showing that lamb cells actually contain estrogen receptors on their surface. And then there are anecdotal reports of <coughs> lamb worsening uh, during pregnancy or when women are given exogenous estrogen, as was commonly occurring in the past with um, postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy. However, and, and until recently, all patients with LAM would be put on the droxyprogesterone. For a period of time, many patients with LAM were told to undergo oophorectomies. Um, all of these intended to lower estrogen levels, but there is absolutely no compelling evidence that hormonal manipulation is beneficial, and for that reason, it's been abandoned. Well, how about serolimus? This is the big story, the big news in this disease. Once we understood that this disease works through the mTOR pathway, it was also nice to know that there was a drug that had been introduced and, in fact, FDA approved. It was an mTOR inhibitor. It had absolutely nothing to do with LAM. In fact, it is not FDA approved for LAM. It was introduced in the organ transplant world because the mTOR pathway is also involved in T cell proliferation. That's a component of cellular rejection. So rapamycin was developed um, as an anti-rejection medication in solid organ transplantation and was then subsequently applied to the lamb population in a study that appeared in the New England Journal in 2011 with Frank McCormick from Cincinnati being the lead investigator. It was a prospective randomized trial. You can imagine it took a long time to enroll because you're talking about a relatively rare disease. And in the first year, uh, women were randomized to either receive uh, rapamycin or placebo. In the second year, the treatment group, the drug was stopped, and they were observed off of drug. There are two important points that, were, that can be shown on this uh, curve here. The first is that there was a significant difference in lung function at the end of one year between the treatment group and the placebo group, such that the treatment group maintained a higher FEV1 during that entire year compared to declining FEV1 in the placebo group. But notably, once the drug was stopped, the rate of decline in lung function then paralleled that for placebo group. So the drug works while it's given, but unfortunately the effect wanes after the drug is stopped. Initially, RAPA was thought that maybe it would actually improve lung function, and there were some initial anecdotal reports that it did. But if you actually look at the spectrum of changes in the treatment group, shown in, in the blue bars here, 
most of the patients had very little change in FEV1. So it was a lung function stabilizing drug. It was only in very few patients who experienced significant improvement in their lung function. But this is in contrast to the placebo group, where most of these patients actually declined over that year. RAPA is not without its side effects. And the most common are nuisance side effects, mouth ulcers. Virtually all patients develop hyperlipidemia. Rash is not uncommon, lower extremity edema. But two of the most feared complications have really not materialized. You can imagine that a drug that was developed for prevention of organ transplant rejection has immunosuppressive effects to it. So there was a concern that there would be an increased risk of infection. But in point of fact, there was no difference in the rate of infection between the treatment and placebo groups. There's also a very concerning but unusual side effect called RAPA pneumonitis. You get lymphocytic infiltration of the lung, fever, parenchymal infiltrates on radiograph. We see this in our lung transplant patients who are starred on RAPA. But there have been few, if any, reports of pneumonitis developing in lab patients who are treated with the drug, probably because we're using much lower doses of the drug. Well, how about statins? Right now, most of that data comes from a mouse model of LAM that was actually developed at my former institution, Vera Kromskaya and her colleagues at Penn. Developed a mouse model where TSC null, that the gene has been inactivated. TSC null cells are injected into the tail vein of the mouse. They gravitate towards and take up residence in the lung. And they create a disorder that looks very much like LAM in humans, in that you see these collections of LAM cells that develop. And you also see airspace enlargement. And this is just some quantitative techniques that Vera used to document the development of these lesions, and also to document airspace enlargement. This is mean alveolar airspace area. So it's a quantitative way of defining the extent of airspace enlargement. And you can see development of these lesions and development of airspace enlargement over time. This is a complicated slide, but I'm going to show you some simple lessons that were learned. So what she did was, compared to controls, they looked at the effect of giving RAFA versus the effect of giving simvastatin. And then I'm going to ignore the last part, which is combination therapy. But they looked at it on lesional growth and on development of airspace enlargement. And if you look at the growth of these lesions, these collections of HMV45 positive cells, RAFA has a profound effect on reducing the size and number of these lesions. Simvastatin had a lesser effect, but still some effect compared to controls. This was the important observation. If you look at airspace enlargement using either a technique called mean linear intercept that I won't go into here, or actually quantifying the area of these airspaces, you can see that rapamycin had very little effect on cyst formation, whereas the statin had a relatively profound and statistically significant effect. The same when we used a different quantitative measure. Rapamycin really did not affect cyst formation in the lung, whereas the statins did. So this has generated an interest in giving combination therapy. Rapamycin to prevent or diminish the growth of these HMV45 lesions, and simvastatin to actually prevent or attenuate the development of cysts in the lung. And we are now in the process of a phase one trial that was started at Penn and several other centers now, looking at the combination of these two drugs to see if it would have a synergistic effect compared to rapa alone. A few words on lung transplantation, and then I think I will wrap up and skip some of my last slides here. So this is reserved for patients who have life-threatening disease, typically an FEV1 that's come down to very severe levels. On average, if you look at patients who are transplanted who are in the national database, their FEV1 is around 24% of predicted, very limited functionally in terms of six-minute walk distance. Importantly, prior pleurodesis, which is done for many of these women because of new pleurises, it does complicate the procedure. It makes it very hard to explant the lung, but it does not preclude or contraindicate transplantation. You just need an experienced surgeon who's capable of handling a complex pleural space. 
There's evidence that replacing two lungs is actually a better outcome than one, but this data is not yet conclusive. And survival is among the best of any patient population for which we offer lung transplant, probably because these are young, otherwise healthy individuals with about a 90% one-year survival and about a 50% ten-year survival. A couple observations that we've made in the transplant population. Um, I've mentioned one, which is that you very often encounter extensive pleural adhesions at the time of explantation of the lungs. And very often that, that will occur even in the absence of pleurodesis. So the disease itself seems to engender uh, the development of pleural adhesions. And this leads to intraoperative bleeding. Um, but ultimately, if you get the patient through the operative and perioperative phase, as I showed you, they've done quite well. They can develop complications of their native disease. So chylose effusions can occur post-transplant. If you leave a lung in place by doing a single lung transplant, um, then you potentially raise the risk of neophoreses in the native lung. And curiously, as I mentioned, there can be disease recurrence in the allograft. Here's one of our patients at Penn who you can see some early cyst formation in the, in the uh, new allografts. Um, and one important point to mention, and this has become very uh, controversial, is rapamycin. So many of these women, you can imagine, who are on transplant lists are on rapamycin. The problem with rapamycin is, as an anti-proliferative drug, it also inhibits fibroblast proliferation, which is key to wound healing. One of the key wounds that you have to heal with a lung transplant is the bronchial anastomosis. And when rapa was looked at as an immunosuppressive drug in lung transplant patients, there were reports of case series of fatal bronchial dehiscence. So the drug has to be stopped before transplant and in the perioperative period until you have documented complete healing of the bronchial anastomosis. I'm going to skip through this and conclude because we are running out of time here. And I'll just talk about where we are now as my last slide. And I think we've come a long way with this disease in terms of understanding its pathogenesis and in terms of introducing some very effective, at least disease stabilizing therapy. So we've gone from a disease that in the past the, the adage was diagnosis to death in 10 years. You will still see this all over the internet. And the first thing that patients come to my clinic with is the absolute fear that they have 10 years to live. They've been given a death sentence with this disease. But in point of fact, at present, 10-year survival approximates 90%. That has nothing to do with lung transplantation. It has nothing to do with rapamycin and everything to do with the fact that we now recognize there's a whole spectrum to this disease, including milder forms. The future, up in the air, I would hope that with the widespread use of rapamycin, that transplant will become a thing of the past, and that end-stage disease will become a thing of the past. And I hope that as we intervene earlier and earlier with less toxic agents, um, that this will no longer be a disease that will in any way strike fear uh, in the hearts of young women. Um, I'm going to end there, and I'm going to thank you for your patience, and hopefully you've enjoyed learning about a rather unusual disease. Thank you. I'm happy to entertain any questions if you have them at this point. You are going to ask one. As you said there in your conclusion, we all hope that all these in-stage lung diseases no longer need transplant and ultimately put us transplanters out of business. But do you have any concerns that maybe what will happen with this disease is a little bit what we saw with IPF earlier was when some medications came out that looked promising that referral to transplant sometimes got delayed, sometimes maybe even fatally delayed. Do you have any concerns that this may happen with the serolimus and transplant? Um, I do a little bit, although I'll tell you what potentially will mitigate that fear is somewhat like the CF community, there are now specialized LAM centers. So many of these patients are being referred early to these LAM designated um, centers or LAM foundation designated centers. And I think most of the physicians participating in those specialized centers are aware of these issues and hopefully um, will not be referring late to transplantation. But you're right, that's always the fear that when you introduce a therapy that it's going to lead to delayed referral for transplant when in fact it might be appropriate. And not to get off track, but I think that's one of our concerns about the coming out uh -huh. of pulmonary fibrosis. Is that going to 
save those patients or is it going to delay them to coming to a more definitive therapy? So. Yeah, and we've certainly learned with pulmonary hypertension, another treatable disease, that the problem with that, the good news is we're treating patients effectively. The bad news is that when they're finally referred for transplant, they are really sick. Really sick. <laughs> Questions, please? Uh, so, so I thought in the, or one of the earlier slides, you said that it was a tumor suppressor signaling pathway which involved in disease. So generally the textbook story about that is that there's some second hit that has to come along to initiate. So I was curious as to yeah. of the number of people who have the genetic defect, how many ultimately have a disease? And since you pointed out the uterus and females, I was curious about the connection to pregnancy, whether the women who have to who develop clinical disease can be nolligravid or have they become pregnant. So to answer the first question, um, it is, at least in the sporadic form of the disease, it is felt that there's probably a two-hit phenomenon there, that many of these patients are probably genetically heterozygous, and then there's something that creates a homozygous state in the particular tissue that's involved through a spontaneous mutation, but no one really knows more about it than that. So it's just a theory that there's a two-hit phenomenon to cause the disease. In terms of pregnancy, um, it's a big controversy. So there are clearly case reports of exacerbations of the disease with pregnancy. But if you really look closely at those reports, it's mostly chylus effusions or pneumothorax. It's very hard to find documentation that the that lung function itself deteriorates dramatically under the influence of estrogen. For that reason, you get two schools of thought. You get some clinicians who tell patients they should never become pregnant, and you get other physicians such as myself who tell women with well-preserved lung function that the documentation is weak and that as long as they're willing to accept some uncertainty related to the pregnancy that we would fully endorse it and help them through their pregnancy. We have seen many, many women with LAMB successfully navigate pregnancy without any change in lung function. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I just was curious about two things. One is a symptom burden, um, even though we've prolonged um, life in these women, fortunately. I just wondered, what is their quality of life? And, um, you know, especially during those years when, when people are very active working and such. Um, the second question is, what happened to the woman's daughter that you mentioned in the beginning? <laughs> Andrea. So the first question about quality of life is, um, for women who have reasonably well-preserved lung function, quality of life is quite good. Um, I can tell you, in general, for patients with mild disease, I see them once a year in the clinic. Um, and even for patients on rapamycin, while it has a number of nuisance side effects, um, I don't think it significantly impairs quality of life for most patients taking the drug. Obviously, for women who have very advanced disease, uh, it dramatically impairs quality of life, and um, uh, is, you know, that's obviously a major issue. The, the second question was uh, to Andrea. Um, I'm happy to report that Andrew's actually um, doing quite well. She's very actively involved in the LAMB Foundation. Her mother, Sue, just retired last year. Um, but she, uh, and she's also benefited from the development and introduction of rapamycin that has stabilized her disease. It's very interesting. Uh, to the point, very specific, like it. I have one or two observations from your presentation about the progression and the pathogenesis of the disease. It seems that the oxygen tension has to do with the overall disease progression because lung is the more is the most important three direction site here, but when it takes the form of AML and to survive there, those cells, uh -huh. they recruit too much of blood vessels for vascularization. Yes. So it seems that at the molecular level, probably the conditions of hypoxia is <coughs> recreated in the lung where it should not be and stabilizes those factors which is basically meant for the upregulation of side cycle uh -huh. control pathways. So my question here is because it's basically called predominantly of pulmonary implications here, if something of the targeted therapeutics develop where it can only affect the lung where you can restore the TS2 functions there, and it should be all right. So you're talking about selectively targeting the mutation in the lung as opposed to systemically? Yeah, it doesn't matter even if it is germline right. transmission. So the only thing I can tell you there is there's a, um, 
strong interest and there's about to be a clinical trial looking at inhaled therapy. So um, a company has developed inhaled rapamycin mm -hmm. and you would think that if you want to target the lung that using the inhaled route would be ideal because you get very high concentrations within the lung, hopefully minimal absorption within the bloodstream. So there are individuals who are thinking exactly like you that um, maybe that's the appropriate way to go in, in I mean, AMLs are in general a very benign process, so we really don't have to care about them, but let's focus on the mutation within the lung itself. Yep. So in the interest of time, if you want to have, I'm sure you'd sure. be happy to um, answer questions. Uh, it is a tradition in our uh, <laughs> program now that each of our presenters from uh, your other institutions actually goes home with a gift. And um, I won't take any credit for this. Dr. Roman took care of this, but this was a Little slugger bat, which has your name and the date on it, and you know, very much of your time. And hope that this will serve as a nice reminder of your time. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.